so thank you all for coming welcome if you're interested in squaring the circle between patents and antitrust then you came to the right place we do want to thank our sponsors for this event for because it's uh it's the only way we can pull this off and want to mention acacia research group the biotechnology innovation organization ieee usa intellectual ventures interdigital the pharmaceutical research and manufacturers of america and u.s inventor well the woman who founded this organization eagle forum education legal defense fund was about the first leader in the conservative movement to get engaged in patent issues and it's not surprising because phyllis schlafly watched her own father inventing over the several years he invented a rotary engine she and watched him get a patent on his invention and uh, the in the debate over era she talked in, in part talked about uh, the the role of inventors in improving the lives of women uh, with uh, conveniences uh, practical conveniences so those were some things that informed her and as a commissioner on the bicentennial of the constitution commission uh, she focused on article one section eight so naturally she led the way to defending uh, invention inventors and property rights of patents and our patent system so our discussion today focuses on the intersection of patents and antitrust now at first blush these appear maybe at odds uh, in some respects certainly they are but patent patents um, grant exclusivity over invention and then antitrust promotes consumer welfare through market competition so how can the right to exclude under patents promote competition well, that's kind of the question we're going to direct our uh, panel at. And the answer, and to cut to the chase, is dynamic competition. And that's today's focus. Dynamic competition is the prism for getting the right perspective on patent exclusivity and antitrust competitiveness and how they can live in harmony or something like that. So leading off uh, today's program, we are honored to have Deputy Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, Laura Peter. Introducing her is going to be Eagle Forum Education Legal Defense Fund's Executive Director, Rebecca Gantner. Thank you all for being here this afternoon. About two days on the job, Laura Peter attended a meeting that Ed Martin, Jim Edwards, and I had with Director Iancu, Deputy Director Peter, and senior PTO staff. We met to acquaint them with our organization and our work on patent issues. Since then, we've gotten to know Ms. Peter and appreciate her commitment to secure reliable patents and patent rights. Laura Peter is the Deputy Undersecretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Deputy Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. There she handles all agency operations and is principal advisor to the PTO director. Ms. Peter is a woman of talent, ability, and experience. She began her career as an IP litigator, then served as legal counsel and executive at Foundry Networks and at Immersion Corporation. These posts included IP portfolio management and litigation. Before joining the PTO, Ms. Peter was Deputy General Counsel at the information technology firm A10 Networks. In addition to overseeing A10's commercial agreements, litigation, and IP portfolio development, she was involved in the company's initial public offering. World, P World IP Review has recognized her as one of the most influential women in IP. We're proud to have Laura with us today. Thank you so much. I get to take my mask off too. I can breathe again. Good afternoon, everyone. Rebecca, thank you for that gracious introduction. That was lovely. 
I'm especially happy to be here today, not only for the Eagle Forum's love of inventors, but also because this is my first in-person event since the pandemic began. So it's a real joy to be talking to you all in person and not through a computer. Thank you to the Eagle Forum for your ardent friendship to American inventors and innovation, but also thank you for putting on this event in a safe and responsible way. It's a pleasure. I'd like to start with a little bit of philosophical grounding in uh, American intellectual property and how intellectual property became a part of our United States Constitution. Our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, John Adams, and others, were all students of philosophy. John Locke was an 18th century political philosopher, and he had a great influence on all of them. <clears throat> His views is that human beings are endowed with certain natural rights, namely life, liberty, and property. And we know that those words found their way into the Declaration of Independence as written by Thomas Jefferson with a slight operate, uh, alteration of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So of course, John Locke's philosophy became a pillar in our nation's uh, constitution, of course, and it found its way too into Article I, Section 8 of our Constitution on Intellectual Property. During the Trump administration, we at the USPTO have worked hard to bolster and strengthen these founding rights. It is the protection of inventors provided by United States patent system that provides all with the opportunity to achieve the American dream and that creates industries which have revolutionized global commerce. Now it's my delight to speak to you about a few of our accomplishments over the past few years and the current state of IP in our country. Under the leadership of the Trump administration, we at the USPTO have been working to hard to spur innovation across America, including of late with respect to COVID technologies. Nine months ago, we were just learning about what coronavirus was. We didn't have any idea of the scope of its impact, of its duration, or how many people it would affect. Yet, just this last September 23rd, there were at least 92 potential vaccines under evaluation. There were more than 40 in preclinical evaluation. And notably, there are now 10 vaccines in phase three clinical trials. Although our lives have yet to return to normal, this is really quite remarkable. Innovations and intellectual property that were already percolating in the scientific community and health industry gave researchers and scientists a head start in developing vaccines for this pernicious disease. Their efforts based on prior achievements lend support to the notion that IP is a critical factor in eliminating the coronavirus. At the USPTO, our duty is not to create cutting edge medicines or uh, brand new vaccines that would cure this disease, but the Constitution does make it the USPTO's duty to protect and promote the progress and science of the useful arts. That is to protect and promote the inventions and inventors and the intellectual property of those that create and develop such things for the benefit of humanity. Every day, this administration and all of us at the PTO pledge our fidelity to this constitutional mandate and to the protection of innovators and entrepreneurs who have made and continue to make this country great. From the start of the pandemic, the USPTO took immediate action to give relief to support innovators and entrepreneurs and to spur innovation. Within two days of the passage of the CARES Act on March 27, we extended virtually all patent and trademark filing dates. We made electronic filing available for almost all filings, including for the initial patent term extension document and filing for pat plant patents. And we provided for early publication of COVID-related applications. 
We initiated a new Patents for Partnership platform that lists COVID-related patents and patent applications whose owners have designated them as available for licensing. We also created COVID-19 Prioritized Examination Pilot Program for both patents and trademarks for COVID-related applications. This is so that they can get accelerated processing. These new initiatives aimed at ending the pandemic are proving to be very popular. We cur currently have more than 892 licensed postings on our Patents for Partnership platform. Plus, over 300 patent applicants and 170 trademark applicants have requested prioritized examination. And as a result of this program, we have 13 patents that have been allowed so far. We also created the COVID-19 Response Resource Center, which is a special section of our website dedicated to hosting information regarding all of our COVID-related initiatives. You can access this page from the main page of our USPTO.gov website, and there's a blue ribbon, ribbon across the page with some points of interest, and there's a link right there smack dab in the middle where you can get to the COVID Resource Center. According to the 2020 U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Global Innovation Policy Center, the GIPC, their international IP index, the U.S. has the second strongest intellectual property system in the world. And for trademarks and copyright protection, we have the strongest and we rank it number one. That's good news. And it's the result of a lot of hard work by the folks at the USPTO who maintain our system of protecting inventors. For the United States to remain the world's preeminent power, we must continue to ensure reliable intellectual property rights are granted that can be meaningfully enforced. This issue is of immense importance to the current administration and also personally to the Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Andre Yanko, and to me. Over the past four years, we've instituted a number of reforms aimed at making United States patents more reliable, stable, and predictable. Specifically, we've taken action in the examination process and in the patent proceedings at the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, the PTAB, with respect to patent subject matter eligibility under Section 101. Although statutory language regarding patent subject matter eligibility has remained virtually unchanged since Thomas Jefferson's day in the 1790s, we know that certain judicial decisions introduced more uncertainty in Section 101's legal application recently. The USPTO's efforts to clarify these matters notably include the, two, the 2018 Berkheimer Memorandum and the 2019 Revised Patent Subject Matter Eligibility Guidelines. Since issuing both these sets of guidance, the USPTO has seen a significant drop in the rate of Section 101 subject matter eligibility rejections. And in fact, a report published in April confirmed the uncertainty, uncertainty decreased by about 44%. At the PTAB, there have been also important changes there. We have uh, instituted the PTAB claim construction standard, namely the change from the, the quote, broadest reasonable interpretation standard to the Phillips standard, which is the same standard used by the federal courts and by the ITC, and also to, to post-grant proceedings. Patent owners now have the opportunity to draft narrower claims if patent claims are invalidated post-grant. Our PTAB also updated the trial practice guide and published two new standard operating procedures. One outlines procedures used for judicial assignments, and the second creates a precedential opinion panel. I am happy to report, too, that during the pandemic, our PTAB and TTAB, our Trademark Trial and Appeal Board, were among the first tribunals in the nation to adopt hearing procedures in a virtual setting. In July, we launched 
the Fast Track Appeals pilot program that allows appellants to accelerate the timeline for ex parte appeals. It's similar to accelerated examination of patent applications under our Track 1 program. So as you can see, we at the USPTO have remained busy and focused, and we continue to seek ideas for meaningful reforms and improvements. I'd be remiss at this event if I didn't mention the work surrounding the 2019 USPTO NIST Department of Justice Joint Policy Statement on Standard Essential Patents Subject to Voluntary RAND and FRAND commitment, uh, Commitments. As you may know, some had read the earlier 2013 statement to st signal that injunctions and other exclusionary remedies should not be available in actions for infringement of standard essential patents. And then in 2014, the Federal Circuit emphatically stated that there is no per se rule that injunctions are not available. That was in Apple versus Motorola. So taken together, it became clear we, it was time to issue a new policy. The 2019 statement intended to resolve this misinterpretation and to encourage balance in our patent ecosystem and to further strengthen patent rights. Overall, both licensees and licensors seem satisfied with the clarity of the 2019 policy that it provides. Of course, this has potential implications for antitrust enforcement as well and for the promotion of competition for the benefit of consumers. I defer to the rest of today's experts to discuss this in further detail, but we are generally seeing a trend emerging in the United States and European authorities determining that violations of SEP commitments are more of a breach of contract issues rather than antitrust issues. We at the USPTO look forward to continuing these discussion and engagement on these issues. Rest assured that all of the changes in recent months over the past four years of the administration and those that might come in the future have, made with, have been made with the goal of making our IP system reliable, predictable, and strong. These reforms ensure that all Americans can build on the ideals that our nation was founded on and so that they can reap the rewards of their efforts which they have sown. A true commitment to the continued protection of our inventors will keep our country great and stronger than ever before. Now I started with a discussion of America's founders and I want to come back to that. Thomas Jefferson was a member of the first patent board under the Patent Act of 1790. In his words, ingenuity should receive a liberal encouragement. Thomas Jefferson was a true friend of inventors and innovation, and I try to be a friend as well as such. Thank you to the Eagle Forum for your continued advocacy on behalf of inventors and your devoted friendship to them. And thank you for inviting me here today. Well, thank you very much for your remarks, Deputy Director Peter. Well, this year we have uh, introduced something new, or are in the process today of introducing something new. We created an award, the Phyllis Schlafly Friend of American Invention Award. With this award, Eagle Forum Education Legal Defense Fund recognizes leadership to strengthen the U.S. patent system and advance the exclusive right of inventors to their inventions for limited times. Recipients have shown leadership by advocating and working for reliable and forcible patents. They stand up for inventors' freedom to exercise patent exclusivity and to reap the fruits of their inventive uh, labor. By what uh, we've observed during Laura Peters' tenure, at the PTO, she mirrors the spirit of the Phyllis Schlafly uh, Friend of American Invention Award. Therefore, it's my pleasure to in invite her and John Schlafly, Phyllis's oldest son, to join me up here. And we have a little uh, memento.
that is beautiful. My honor. My honor. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. And now, um, it's a pleasure to, to bring up our next speaker. Alden Abbott is the general counsel of the Federal Trade Commission. Before returning to the FTC in 2018, Mr. Abbott was deputy director and senior legal fellow at the Edwin Meese Center of the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Mr. Abbott previously held senior positions at the Federal Trade Commission, including associate director, and he also served at, in the Department of Justice and of Commerce. He was director of global patent law and competition strategy at Research in Motion, the maker of BlackBerry wireless devices. His expertise includes both intellectual property and antitrust. So he's the right guy to come and, uh, and discuss this topic with us. Alden, welcome. Uh, well, thank you very much, Jim, for that very kind in introduction. And I want to also express my thanks to Rebecca, who is here, to uh, the Eagle Forum, to the Schlafly family for their support for strong intellectual property rights, uh, which are, as has already been noted by, by Laura, tremendously important to the future dynamism of the American economy. Now, the, the uh, views expressed today are my own, not necessarily those of the Federal Trade Commissioner or any federal, uh, federal Trade Commission or any Federal Trade Commissioner. Now, going back to uh, American history, uh, I, we've heard about Thomas Jefferson's views. Uh, James Madison, father of our Constitution, wrote about uh, the importance of intellectual property and patent rights on copyright too in, in Federalist uh, 43, when he wrote, quote, the public good fully, fully coincides with the claims of individuals, close quote, individuals referring to inventors in particular and, and to copyright holders. And subsequently in 1792 in his famous essay on property, he defined property as very broadly as anything really pertaining to the individual, including a right in his or her thoughts. And that also has been seen as a great supporter of intellectual property rights. So just to underscore, the founders, uh, you sometimes hear some criticism of intellectual property rights or their second class property rights. Not at all. I think the, the, the founders fully realize their importance and emphasize them. Now, uh, how does intellectual property support innovation? Uh, see what the Council of Economic Advisors, President's Council of Economic Advisors said in 2020. Quote, consumers often benefit most from dynamic competition as driven by investment in innovation, new products, inventions, and technologies. Intellectual property rights, such as patents, trademarks, and copyrights, limit competition from infringing products in order to encourage this dynamic competition. So again, the idea that these are monopolies or special rights that somehow harm competition is not at all true. In fact, they encourage investment in new processes and products that compete vigorously in a marketplace. Uh, another uh, patent expert, uh, former Inter International Trade Commission Scott Keefe, professor at GW Law School, has written that patents are, quote, beacons in the dark, drawing to themselves all of those potential complementary users of the patent protected asset to interact with the patent owner and each other. In other words, the ability to get a property right, a well-defined property right, encourages others to come together and to push the commercialization and development of new technologies. So what about antitrust? Now, I think most of you probably know antitrust deals generally with uh, uh, anti-competitive agreements, agreements that restrict competition among firms and also mergers and agreements to fix prices or divide markets. Basically, roughly defined business ac activities that are not on the merits. Now, uh, the, in the U.S., there is state and federal antitrust enforcement, but federal antitrust enforcement is shared by the Federal Trade Commission and the Justice Department. Federal Trade Commission also has authority 
over consumer protection, data privacy, things of that sort, but it does not bring criminal cartel cases, which Justice Department does. Now, sound enforcement of the antitrust laws, we believe, uh, is complementary, works with IP law and patent law, not against it. Properly understood, it promotes innovation by attacking exclusionary practices that harm dynamic competition. <coughs> so IP rights, as we've seen, encourage firms to engage in competition, but business schemes that diminish competition are not shielded by the mere fact uh, that IP rights are involved in the schemes. <coughs> the key question is whether IP is being invoked in a manner that goes beyond the legitimate scope of the rights protected under IP law. What do we mean by that? The patent holder certainly, uh, we believe, has the right to full returns on the intellectual property, to licensing full returns to that value, but uh, it doesn't have a right, say, to enter into a price-fixing agreement with a, another patent holder who produces a competing patent or competing drug, so they fix the price of licenses to be able to produce drugs. That sort of thing, that would be price fixing agreement, goes beyond the scope of the patent right. <clears throat> now, the Federal Trade Commission, for over 20 years, has used policy tools to address emerging issues at the inter intersection of antitrust and intellectual property, including convening public hearings to examine issues such as the role role of patent quality and the role of antitrust to uh, promoting innovation. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission issued a report uh, in 2003 on, on the workings of the patent system and innovation. A joint report in 2007 with the Justice Department's Antitrust Division on inf antitrust enforcement and intellectual property rights. A 2009 report in, on antitrust and biologic drug competition and a 2011 report on the evolving market marketplace for intellectual property dealing with issues of public notice and remedies for patent infringement. Now, uh, the FTC also issued a report in 2016 on patent assertion entities, firms that buy up a lot of patents, uh, and I think properly understood, the report says that in and of themselves there's nothing prob problematic. In fact, I think the economists would say <coughs> it's very understandable that firms may buy up a lot of patents <coughs> because the inventor may not specialize in distributing or building things and wants to do business with an intermediary which can uh, distribute patent rights and, and also facilitate manufacturing. So that uh, is that point. Now, uh, Policy work, the Justice Department and uh, Federal Trade Commission's general view on intellectual property licensing uh, is contained <coughs> in IP licensing guidelines, originally issued in 1995 and uh, released again in slightly revised form in 2017. And I will obviously, I'm not going to get into details, but the big take home points are that uh, three major principles apply. One, the Federal Antitrust Agency will apply the same analysis to conduct involving IP, including, of course, patents, as to other forms of property, taking into account the specific characteristics of a particular property right. Two, the agencies do not presume that IP creates market power in the antitrust context. In other words, we're not going to treat you as a monopolist just because you hold a patent on a particular, uh, covering manufacturing particular good. Three, the antitrust agency recognize that IP licensing allows firms to com combine complementary factors of production and is generally pro-competitive. And I'd underscore the, it is generally pro-competitive, uh, efficiencies of licensing, uh, innovative efficiencies, reducing transactions costs are considered, uh, and balance under against any potential loss of camp competition. But unlike before the 1980s, when the antitrust agencies were very suspicious of intellectual property licensing, now, as a general matter, they are not. They, they view that as generally pro-competitive and have said so in international fora. So uh, beyond the guidelines, uh, the FTC has uh, held hearings, most recently 2018 and 19 on uh, patents, 
patents were taken up in the hearings on antitrust and consumer protection in the 21st century. There were two, two days on IP and patent policy uh, focused on the role of government in, in promoting innovation, addressing whether and if so, to what extent government should have a role in promoting innovation, which in, in turn affects the competitive landscape. What do I mean about the role of government? Well, for example, uh, the Bayh-Dole Act, many of you are familiar with, has sparked substantial innovation from federal labs by allowing private sector innovators to obtain patents based on R&D carried out at those labs, particularly in the biotech, pharma, and defense industries. And uh, so that's very important. Now, the 21st century hearings also uh, noted the Section 101 debate, which has already been uh, alluded to in my personal view, and I think the uh, view of probably a number of people here is that the Supreme Court very unfortunately created uh, exemptions to patentable subject matter which can't be found in the la la language of the statute and has undoubtedly made it harder for patentees uh, uh, to uh, potentially obtain patents in the first place. I'm not going to talk about some other issues, but certainly that was raised. And interestingly enough, there was a report was alluded to. to uh, there was a 2020, August 2020 report by the Alliance of U.S. Startups and Inventors for Jobs, which already showed a shift of venture capital resources away from R&D intensive industries due to a patent system uh, that has facilitated patent infringement without consequences. And that is uh, the issue about the Supreme Court's decision 14 years ago, getting rid of a presumption that uh, a patent holder could normally obtain an injunction uh, in the case of patent infringement. Uh, it, they said, oh, there's a rule of reason case by case. However, uh, that has complicated lives and in many, many courts, unfortunately, have been quite reluctant to issue uh, injunctions. Uh, and also, I think that undercuts the, no the notion of property right. The owner of a parcel of land has a right to eject people or keep people off his or her property. Similarly, a patent holder should have the right to eject and join someone from using uh, their intellectual property. Now, uh, I think I alluded briefly, there's additional scholarship by uh, how legal changes have weakened the patent system and undermined the, uh, innovation. Won't go into it. I meant, already mentioned injust, uh, injunctions. There's uh, one uh, in interesting article by Christian Stout, Jeff Manny, Julian Morris, and Dirk Auer uh, uh, entitled The Deterioration of Appropriate Remedies in Patent Disputes uh, uh, in the Federalist Society Review. And you can find that if you, if you uh, Google Jeff Manny after going to the website, Truth on the Market all one word, toothonthemarket.com. Now, I will talk briefly about anti FTC antitrust enforcement. Uh, FTC has had a long history of antitrust enforcement in the IP space. A lot of it uh, historically involving standard setting organizations, but frankly, in the last few years, very little of that. There were a number of, most of the cases involving standard setting organizations involved allegations <laughs> that a patent holder was deceiving uh, a standard setting organization in order to induce development of a standard that uh, would create monopoly power because the patents of that firm would, would quote, unquote, read on, on the standard so they could get higher than normal ro royalties. Uh, very, very frankly, uh, there were a number of settlements. There was one case uh, Rambus v. FTC, where the FTC lost and, and D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals uh, because the uh, court in that case said we you haven't shown FTC that that was a but for, that any deception that might have occurred before the standard setting body was a but for case. So uh, I'm not going to mention uh, uh, the Qualcomm matter. A lot of you are familiar with it. I have been recused on that matter. I'm, some other people may wish to address it. So let me t quickly conclude. Uh, I hope my overview of FTC policy and litigation initiatives involving IP and I trust has sparked your interest. The FTC's goal in pursuing these initiatives 
is to promote innovation, enhance consumer welfare, but antitrust is an imperfect science. There is no crystal ball. Uh, that was a question addressed to me, no crystal ball, and it's important upon antitrust enforcers, in my view, to get IP antitrust right and to recognize the importance of this as a property right. And I think that Assistant Attorney Ge uh, General Del Rahim, who has uh, popularized a so-called New Madison approach to intellectual property, may have some intriguing things to, to say about that uh, later in the program. Thank you again. Well, Alden Abbott, too, deserves the Phyllis Schlafly Friend of American Invention Award. His public service and thought leadership reflect the, the keen understanding of the exclusive property rights that patents secure, the innovative effects and dynamic competition that IP yield, and how th these pro-competitive phenomena serve the interests of, con of consumers. At Heritage, he critiqued legislative, judicial, and executive attacks on property rights, and particularly patent rights, including the mislabeled Innovation Act. He grounded his critiques of contemporary issues on foundational principles such as those embodied in Article I, Section 8. He didn't shy away from criticizing his former agencies, and they apparently didn't take it personally. They took him back. But he continues to bear in mind the appropriate application of antitrust where IP is involved. So it's a pleasure to recognize Alden Abbott by presenting him the Phyllis Schlafly Friend of the Amer American Invention Award. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, Josh Malone, invented the top-selling summer toy bunch of balloons. You probably got to enjoy some of that this summer, I hope. Josh's patent and invention fills and ties 100 water balloons in less than a minute. Beats the old-fashioned way, huh, Josh? The patents, uh, a a the patents, a wildly successful Kickstarter campaign and quick uh, commercial success landed him in the dark side of patents, willful patent infringers, inferior knockoffs, and the, a tool of the administrative state known as the Patent Trial and Appeal Board. No, no personal offense. Uh, through Mr. Malone's experience and work with inventors in the organization U.S. Inventor, he's seen how in innovation empowers private enterprise. And that uh, commercialization of innovation can break up monopolies. So to hear more about that, Josh Malone. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Jim. Uh, Thank you to Phyllis Schlafly Eagles. Um, I actually was, uh, Phyllis Schlafly brought the patent situation to my attention uh, many decades ago um, with the, the harmonization effort. And a lot of what we see today, I remember her uh, warning us about, and I really had no idea what she was talking about, even though I was an inventor. Um, she was way ahead of us. So uh, yeah, so I, I am an inventor. Um, I, I think I'm still an inventor. It's been a long time since I invented. Uh, I've been. Uh, working my way through the, the legal system, and now I'm a, a full-time uh, volunteer advocate with uh, U.S. Inventor. So, um, working to um, advance the cause and educate and uh, make things fair for, for inventors. And so, I, 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 this is a fascinating uh, subject, and I've seen a lot of angst and frustration and felt it. A lot of you in the room have about um, uh, you know, the, the concentration of power in the, in the online platforms and the challenges with privacy, with uh, uh, content, um, with shadow banning, with uh, lots, of, lots of controversial stuff now. And, it's, of course, we're in the thick of it now with uh, an election upon us. And I've thought for some time now that um, 
you know, there, there is a role for inventors and innovators to play in this. Um, at, at root, uh, consumers don't want these products that invade their privacy. Consumers don't want other people choosing their content for them. And so the question is why aren't there better choices? Why are we stuck with a handful of ways to communicate uh, with the world and with our networks? Um, we, want better, uh, we, we want better solutions as a, as a, as a consumer. And uh, you know, this is a challenge from social science ex uh, perspective, but it's also, I think, in some respects, a technology challenge. So I, you know, I remember, um, you know, when I was younger, I was I was going to be a trendsetter, and I, you know, I don't need, I don't marketing doesn't work on me. It, why do they pay all that money for those advertise all, all those advertisements? Because I'm going to choose the best product that suits my needs. And as I grew up, I kind of I came to realize that someone has to somehow have to find out what's available, what's available to read, what's available to consume. And so, okay, well I'm going to go off the beaten path. I'm going to get the catalog. Well, who chose what went in the catalog? Um, how does Amazon decide what goes on their marketplace? Uh, and so I, I came to realize that uh, this is a, an area that's a challenge. It's, it's, it's a technical challenge to decide what is the right product, what does the consumer want to see, and what should, what, should, what should they have to choose from, and how do we narrow those selections? Um, you know, even especially with, with, with respect to the internet and search engines. So do you use AltaVista? Do you use Ask Jeeves? Um, you know, of course, now we use Google, right? Um, but even today, we have, uh, we have other options, right? There's DuckDuckGo. And if we really care about privacy and um, uh, 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 independence and, and, and transparency, then we can, uh, we can turn to products like, uh, lost my place. We can turn to products like uh, Signal, Proton Mail, and Tor. Anybody use those products? Um, I feel like I should, but uh, honestly, they're, they're, they're difficult to get to. Um, I, how many of us use uh, the default newsreader on our devices? Apple News or uh, 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 Google, Google News page? Um, how many of us use Bing as our search engine? So these things, are, uh, these things are problems. There are solutions out there, right? But for some reason, they're not available, uh, or they're, they're hard to get. So, so one of the problems here is, some of, the, some of it's a technology problem, so there are some technologies out there that we're just not using. But those technologies need to be improved. There's also a systems problem. And for inventors, and I'm gonna, hopefully I can channel my inventor here a little bit for you guys today, um, we look at things as a whole and we're not bound to the normal way of doing things. So the question is, why can't, so, so if I wanna use um, a social media platform, uh, there's a new one out called Parler. I don't know if anyone signed up for Parler. I signed up, I have never used it. Um, it's supposed to be an alternative to Facebook. And so why can't we use a platform and then communicate with our network on that platform? Right? With, with postal mail, you know how to communicate to your network. With, with the phone lines, you know how to communicate to your network. And with, with email, you know how to communicate to your network. But these newer platforms, like the only ones where your friends are is Facebook, except for your friends that don't use Facebook anymore. And so we've got a problem to solve, and it's partly a technological problem, it's partly a systems problem. Um, there's uh, some of these technologies are available, but they're not widely used. And um, there's this concentration of, hey, if you want to use a search engine, use uh, Google. And if you want to communicate with your friends, use Facebook or Twitter. Um, and so the question is, uh, is there a way to use these tools, these technologies, and th that the market wants? We want privacy. We want control over our content. And there's some tools out there. How can we get our network to use those tools? Is it possible? Well, yes. An inventor says there has to be a way. And so as inventors, we think, you know, we should be able to disrupt this industry uh, by bringing a better product. It's all about competition, about the free market. So if we have a better product, then people will come. Um, in fact, that's how I came up with a bunch of balloons, right? That was, uh, for 63 years, people were filling balloons one at a time and tying them with a knot. And um, because that's the only way there was to do it. I mean, wh what else are you going to do? You've got to have a water balloon war, so you better plan ahead, and you better uh, get those balloons together. It, it, there was even a service. Uh, a, an entrepreneurial couple figured out they could fill people's water balloons for them and deliver them. 
and that was a big that was a business in 2012. Um, the University of Kentucky set the Guinness Book of World Records for a water balloon fight. I think they had uh, half a million participants almost in their water balloon fight. They had this crazy uh, logistical uh, situation where they would pre-fill the balloons for the week ahead and they would store them in refrigerated warehouses and refrigerated trucks so that they would last long enough to get to the water balloon fight. Um, so, and that's the world. And today, that's, today our world is what it is. But today, you don't, that's not how you fill water balloons because I said there has to be a better way. And it's really fascinating. I, I really learned as I got involved in patent policy more about uh, our founders' view of patents. And it was really striking to me that the language used in the Constitution is uh, securing to the inventor the exclusive right to their discoveries. And that really is my motto. Like, we're not creating things from scratch. We're discovering things that already exist. So all the, all the problems that we face, including the problems with um, uh, these, these large incumbent corporations that are using their market power to give us crappy products, there is a solution to that, and it's, it's up to us to discover it. Um, so, again, for an inventor, uh, there's, there's really no limits. And so, um, maybe I'll be a little bit provo provocative here, and the hot topic is 5G. Well, what is 5G? 5G is 20, gilibit, uh, kilobits per, uh, 20 gigabits per second at a certain uh, number of, uh, a certain amount of bandwidth. And um, it's largely been an engineering activity uh, it, it, from my point of view. There's a lot of patents in that space. There's some incremental in innovations in that space. But for the most part, um, the constraints are, uh, you know, do devices have to share a bandwidth, certain bandwidth frequencies available? Um, do all the devices on that network communicating with that transmitter have to share this, the same space? And if there's too many phones on, too many clients on that, on that transmitter, are they going to have to slow down or are you going to have dropped calls? Well, yeah, that's the way it works. Well, not according to an inventor. Um, Steve Perlman is a friend. He's an inventor of a technology called P-Cell, and he thinks it will be the next uh, disruptive technology for uh, wireless networking. Um, quoting from uh, his, his uh, uh, summary, P-Cell meets the proposed 5G performance targets today. While remaining compatible with 4G devices, P-Cell technology accomplishes this through an entirely new approach to wireless. P-Cell embraces interference, utilizing interfering transmissions to synthesize a tiny personal cell, a P-Cell, around each individual user, enabling each, every user to utilize the full capacity of the spectrum at once. So it's not linear to him. Uh, instead of many users sharing the limited capacity of one cell, resulting in steadily declining data rates as new subscribers join the network. With P-Cell technology, each user gets a personal cell. So no matter how many users are sharing the same spectrum, each user is able to experience the full capacity of the spectrum concurrently with other users. I don't understand that. Um, but I respect it, right? And it's hard sometimes to see things. If you're not an inventor, it's easy to take things for granted. And things come into existence through inventors and then it's like, well, duh, of course. And so inventors aren't bound to these, these boxes. And this is just one idea for tackling wireless communications problems. And maybe, it's, maybe it doesn't have to be wireless. Um, maybe uh, inventors will come up with a way to use multimodal communication technologies and mesh networks. And maybe sometimes you're using data, sometimes you're using uh, uh, optical. And so we have other ways to uh, attack these, these problems that no one's ever thought of before. Um, so why, uh, why is competition shrinking? Why aren't we solving this? I think it's partly due to the poor incentives for disruptive innovation. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have a few, you know, we have a couple of examples of, of innovative technologies that I, you know, one that I used and I appreciated for a while was the Waze mapping technology. Um, it was revolutionary to me. I thought it could tell you where the hazards were, tell you where the police were when you're on a road trip. <laughs> Um, it was bought by Google for a billion dollars and shelved for about six years. Uh, Instagram, uh, bought by Facebook and, and, and integrated it for a billion dollars. Why are these disruptive technologies being sold for one-tenth of one percent of the market cap of the acquisition company? Um, I think it's because they can't protect their exclusive technologies through the patent system. Uh, today, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to your door and steal it. Um, 
The answer, one answer, it's not a panacea, but uh, one way to tackle the, the challenge of uh, monopolistic behavior and abuse of market power by large trillion dollar corporations is to disrupt them with innovation. But to do that, we have to, the owners of that technology have to be able to have exclusive rights to it. So they can't be uh, intruded on, so, they, so that they can't be gobbled up for bargain prices like a billion dollars um, when it's, it's a core technology for, for these companies. So we've mentioned it already. I'll go through the list of, of uh, the three main challenges um, that we're facing. Uh, injunctions are very difficult to obtain, so it's, if it's not an exclusive right, what kind of a right is it? We now have a compulsory licensing system under eBay. Uh, another problem that's often overlooked is uh, to enforce those patents costs you about uh, 10 years in litigation. And only after you get through the 10 years uh, might you get that injunction. So just a, for a startup to be able to survive 10 years trying to acquire and enforce their exclusive rights is a challenge. Um, and then the final uh, challenge has been the Patent Trial and Appeal Board with uh, uh, incredibly high invalidation rates. It's, it's uh, discouraging to inventors and startups um, when they can't rely on uh, the exclusive right when they do succeed. And again, this is focused on uh, breakthrough technologies where we really do have innovation, inventions that would not have existed but for the patent system. Uh, that's one uh, very effective way um, to utilize the market and uh, to disrupt and provide cons and, re and reduce anti-competitive behavior. Um, so that, that's, my, uh, that's my story. Thank you. G Jim, if I may, um, there's really a really hot issue right now um, in, the, uh, in this administration in the last 100 days. I have a handout I'd like to share with everyone so they know what we've been working on lately. Is that okay? Let me introduce our next speaker, Kimberly Chipkowski. Kimberly is a vice president and head of licensing strategy and operations with InterDigital, an innovator that designs and develops advanced technologies that enable and enhance mobile communications and capabilities. Ms. Chotkowski worked as an electrical engineer. Uh, before you, have you met? We've got IEEE USA back here, so you'd want to make, make sure to connect. <laughs> that uh, after her uh, electrical engineering work, at the begin she began to practice law. Uh, some highlights of her career include five years in the 2000s at InterDigital in IP count as IP counsel, and uh, she was engaged in IP strategy and litigation at that time. Ms. Chotkowski served as CEO of the professional organization of, of patent uh, licensing personnel, the Licensing Executive Society USA and Canada. I remember that part too. <laughs> uh, before, before returning to enter digital to lead the company's patent licensing. Because InterDigital develops advanced technologies that contribute to wireless standardization, it actively engages in standards development organizations. And Ms. Chotkowski leads the licensing of the firm's standard essential patents, and she's well qualified to discuss who the real uh, monopolist is, the innovator or the implementer. I'm interested in your answer, Kimberly. Hello and good afternoon. As uh, stated, uh, my name is Kim Chikowski and I am the head of uh, licensing strategy and operations for InterDigital. As also stated, I do have a bit of a unique history with InterDigital as I was uh, with them in the early 2000s and helped to develop their uh, patent portfolio. Uh, I sort of joke all the time that when I first started, I was given 28 disclosures uh, on my desk and I promptly threw all of them out and then uh, scoured the engineering team for proper disclosures and uh, captured the in creative innovations that they were uh, coming up with. 
I left in about 2007 and had my own intellectual property licensing firm uh, for about 12 years. And then I was lucky enough to be chosen by uh, the board of directors of LES, of which one of the wonderful uh, presidents that I work for just walked in the room. So nice to see you, Brian. And I became their first CEO uh, and only CEO of, uh, that I'm aware of uh, from the Licensing Executive Society. During that time, I was uh, lucky enough to work with uh, the Eagle Forum and to get involved in this for the effort for the stronger patents and, and to really wave the flag in that space. So I'm honored to be here and, and to have that opportunity. Uh, during that gap period, and oh, and obviously I'm back at InterDigital now <laughs> for two years. It is very interesting, I will have to tell you, because as I walked down the hall one of the first days, I saw the same faces, but they just had a little grayer hair and maybe a few more pounds on them. So it was a little, a very unique experience that I had. But during that gap time, I had the opportunity to also represent not only the uh, innovator, but also the implementer. So I do have a little bit of a unique perspective from that stem. First, I also would like to thank the Eagle Forum and uh, Jim and Rebecca and John for the time here today and the opportunity to say a few words. It is, as many of us have said, our first outing, you know, from uh, the COVID, uh, the vid, the Rona, whatever your, uh, your term might be. Um, our company decided, it, as many in March, that uh, everybody should have the safety and health opportunities to work at home. What they didn't say is what home you had to work from. So I picked up my entire family and moved out of the beach. So I have to admit, this is the first time I've put heels on in a suit. So it's, uh, it was a little odd trying to get dressed today. Uh, in addition, because of all of that excitement, uh, our family has moved from uh, just the children and the husband to two dogs two cat and three cats. So I'm not sure what uh, Corona is doing to our family, but hopefully it's a positive. I've been asked to say a few words about, uh, well, first of all, also, I'd like to also say that my comments are just my own and not necessarily the views of InterDigital, so I should definitely put that out there. But I've been asked to talk a little bit about who is the real monopolist, uh, the innovator or the inventor. And I thought, well, I could start this conversation like most patent attorneys, registration 45012, just make sure. Or, and I could talk about uh, the United States Constitution, Article 1, or uh, Article 1, Section 8. I could even go back to the letters patent granted uh, by the king in 1449 and discuss the limited monopoly granted to the inventor in exchange for their open public disclosure and as such fostering innovation. While this is the purpose of a limited monopoly, there's also the other side of invention, innovation, implementation. The ability to cre create a commercially viable product for consumer use. So then I thought, how would Macon Delrin go about this? So I went back to some of his speeches, and it seems he really likes music titles. So I thought, what titles could I find fitting in this situation? And what I realized was that the list could be quite long. So here are a few that I came up with. I can't get no satisfaction. Against all odds, ain't misbehaving, I've got the power, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, I will survive, ain't no rest for the wicked, and one that I came across, I've, I'm not really sure if it really applies, but I like the title, our lawyer made us change the name of the song so we wouldn't get sued. That's out from the Fallout Boys. <laughs> I kind of look at it as the long and windy road, but the one that really resonated to me was come together. From where I sit now as a business professional, I would like to argue that in order to really serve the consumer and uh, the global strong patents that we're really achieving and focusing on, both the innovator and the implementer must coexist. In a perfect world, neither of them would be labeled the real monopolist. Having said that, there remains a need to ensure that the rights and obligations of both of these parties are held in balance, and that is where we look to the intersection of IP and antitrust. One of the things, though, and we have uh, recently have been embarking upon it in our organization, is the understanding that what we do have to really focus, though, is on the uh, rule of law and having organizations uphold that rule of law and not just 
be a global bully in this type of environment. For more than 40 years, InterDigital has been at the forefront of wireless technology, a tradition that continues today, with our engineers contributing key technologies to all of the Gs, and currently 5G. We have our advanced research teams working on what lies beyond 5G as well. Since 2005, InterDigital engineers have made approximately 4,000 contributions, and I can attest that there are many more before that. <laughs> as I was also responsible for that side of the house uh, from uh, 2001 to 2007. Whether it's in standards development, advanced research, award-winning partner-driven projects, or prototyping new capabilities for wireless networks and devices, InterDigital's capabilities are driven by our uniting principles, a strong belief in global standards, a commitment to platforms and capabilities that are geared to research instead of products, and, desi and desire to see our industry grow and progress. But inherently, that relies upon the fact there are implementers out there commercializing the very standards that embody our inventions. In exchange for those valued contributions and inventive works to communications and video technology, InterDigital expects a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory return on their investment. It is this FRAN commitment that is intended to balance the interests of companies that develop patent technologies used in standards and companies that produce product that implement those standards. To achieve this level playing field, parties should come together and be transparent. As a publicly traded company, InterDigital has always provided more transparency on our licensing business than many other companies in our industry. However, this year, we have taken this step once further and we have launched a transparency effort we're not only gathering information that's generally public and providing that in one easy repository on our website, but we're also providing another level of data that previously was only provided to prospective customers within the scope of licensing discussions. In fact, we have gone to the level of publishing our wireless rates on our website. We feel that our approach aligns very well with the transparency we see in technical development of the standards themselves where innovations are presented to open forums and industry peers. In turn, there is an expectation that we have that the implementers will also come together, be transparent, and uphold their end of the bargain by engaging in good faith discussions and enter into licenses to the innovative and inventive patent portfolios that are accepted into the standards. However, if there is no meeting of the minds, the patent owner should have the full rights afforded to them under the patent system. The new Madison approach continues this theme of come together with the four core premises. First, hold up is fundamentally not an antitrust injury, but rather a contract or a fraud injury when it is proven. Second, SDOs should not be a mechanism to favor implementers over patent holders. Third, recognizing that a fundamental right in the patent right is the right to exclude and injunctive re remedies should not be disfavored. And finally, antitrust laws should re be regarded as unilateral decisions not to license a patent as per se legal. I would like to applaud the DOJ's most recent supplement to the February 2nd, 2015 business review letter from the Antitrust Division of the United States Department of Justice to the IEEE. Having sat in meetings with ANSI and before the DOJ itself as part of the LES initiative, I am thankful and appreciative for the attention of the DOJ and its efforts to clarify that letter, uh, clarify the 2015 letter. I also applaud the work the Antitrust Division has done to file statements of interest in seven, several distri uh, district court litigations highlighting that FRAN disputes are not creatures of antitrust, but rather a breach of contract. This is a breath of fresh air. I also would like to acknowledge a unique relationship that we've witnessed between the DOJ, the USPTO, and NIST. This coming together of the departments is truly a trifecta of collaboration unprecedented in my time. And we applaud the recent policy statement of the three departments on the standard essential patents. 
The relationship that each of those has is clearly seen as they are often on stage together and how they have worked in all of their interdepartments. While each of these individual topics could have days and seminars dedicated, and Brian, this is not just for LES, I actually wrote this. <laughs> and having been the CEO of the Licensing Executive, Executive Society, trust me, there could be days talked about all these different topics. I circle back to the question on who is the real monopolist, the innovator or the implementer. I would like to suggest that we are in need for that to come together, to coexist and provide the balance of interest by providing access to inventive technology for use in products in exchange for fan-based fan licenses. Thank you again to the Eagle Forum for the opportunity to be part of this during these very difficult times and for their tireless efforts in supporting a stronger U.S. patent system. Thank you. Our uh, final speaker is Patrick Kilbride. Patrick Kilbride is the Senior Vice President of the Global Innovation Policy uh, Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. There, he oversees the center's domestic, multilateral, and international programs uh, and leads GIPC's policy work to promote intellectual property-driven innovation and creativity. Got the, uh, that uh, copyright piece in there, too, huh? Uh, Mr. Kilbride served the, as Deputy Assistant U.S. Trade Representative in the George W. Bush administration. His background in IP and U.S. global competitiveness gives him an important perspective on where IP rights, antitrust enforcement, and American competitiveness may be headed. So Patrick, welcome. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, John, to everyone involved with the Eagle Forum. I guess thank you, first of all, for inviting me to be part of uh, this dialogue with a really distinguished group of, of thought leaders. But most especially, Jim, thank you to you. I think uh, it would be hard to point to a more prolific and compelling thought leader on some of these issues than you. You just consistently keep uh, us zeroed in on the really core issues in the, in the intellectual property debate. I'm the one very grateful. So who'd have thought a year ago that we'd all be here doing this? Uh, it really is a shame. Um, but there is, uh, I, I think, some hope that we see out of it. And uh, I'd like to leave you, I'd like to talk about three numbers. One is uh, 784. The other is three, and the last is five, and I'll, and I'll start with 784. Today, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is tracking 784 COVID-related clinical trials for therapies and vaccines taking part across all 50 states, about 85% of congressional districts, and including more than 13 million Americans. So the fight against COVID-19 is taking, a, taking place in every community in our country People are doing everything they can to bring therapies, to bring vaccines as quickly as possible, and they are succeeding. Why is it that we're able to do this? It's because of an intellectual property system that enabled decades of investment, billions upon billions of dollars in investment, and the assembly of human capital in an unprecedented way, not just in 2020 in response to a pandemic, but long before that pandemic threatened us. And so today you see a robust pipeline of solutions ready to meet this challenge. We think of it first in terms of vaccines and therapies and, and the urgent need to, to help people who are ill or in, in danger of becoming ill. But really, when you think for most of us, the most urgent need is in terms of content, news content, information, educational content, the ability to work remotely, the ability to stay connected with the people that we love and the people that we need to be productive. U.S. intellectual property has provided that. U.S. innovators and creators have brought these solutions over many years uh, in terms of uh, 5G capacity, 
terms of uh, new streaming channels to access information and, and, and entertainment. And so we were ready, uh, maybe not to the degree that we would like to have been, but we were ready to meet this challenge. Uh, what is it behind that IP system that's worked so well? Well, first of all, when you assign clear, transparent, and reliable intellectual property rights, you enable the allocation of resources. You enable investors to say, I can see a productive benefit to putting resources into a riskier uh, proposition than they would otherwise. And they often have to do that with long, long time frames, you know, uh, in, in uh, areas where you may, you may never see a return. In uh, the biopharmaceutical space, for every uh, 10 drugs entering clinical trials, only one ever makes it to market. For in the movies, you have 20 films, one blockbuster pays for the other 19. These are risky propositions that don't happen without clear, transparent, and predictable rights. So we should be grateful that our founders, first of all, and that leaders like you over many decades have supported these rights. Today, uh, that, that onus falls on us here to, to sustain that. Um, and, and we are, are in a challenging time, but also I think a time of immense opportunity. That takes me to that next number, three. Um, how did we get here? And, and not just here you know, in the United States, but all of us as a, as a global society. I, as I look at it, I see three traps. Two of them are, are well known. The first is the Malthusian trap. And that was the theory that uh, gains in productivity would always be matched by gains in population so that the human situation would never get better. Well, intellectual property and the uh, industrial revolution that it enabled blew that trap out of the water. Today, we're, we're beyond the Malthusian trap and we see productivity growing at a faster pace than population. You see the emergence for the first time in human history of a global middle class that we need to fight to preserve today in this pandemic. Um, the second trap is the middle income trap. Uh, and that was uh, proposed by uh, a couple of World Bank economists you know, uh, a couple decades ago. And um, th the idea there was that low-income countries having uh, leveraged labor resources or, or natural resources to go from lower to middle income were then stuck. They couldn't make the leap to upper income. And the reason, I believe, is because they put the infrastructure in place to bring labor and you know, minerals and, and such to, to use, but they didn't yet, they didn't see that to become upper income countries, they had to succeed in a new type of infrastructure for a value added economy. And so you've seen countries like Chile, for instance, with immense natural resources, put in place a, a really robust trade infrastructure with agree more trade agreements than any country in the world. And they did really well at selling their fruit and their copper, but then they've stagnated. They haven't been able to make that leap. And I would argue it's because they have not embraced and they've actually, actually actively rejected uh, an intellectual property system, despite the, you know, the US free trade agreement with Chile that called for them to do that. Um, and when we've seen that repeated uh, in countries around the world, that brings us to the third trap. And this is where we are today in the United States, uh, where, where I think all developed countries are. And this is what I'm calling the missing capital trap, because we have this latent reserve of intellectual assets, our knowledge and know-how that we've failed to capitalize. We've done a better job than anybody else in the world, don't get me wrong. We established the strongest system of patent rights and copyrights and trademarks. We've been forward leaning on trade secrets, but those are fairly limited in, in scope. Our ambition has been very modest. Today, as we, uh, as we gather intellectual resources, as we depend more and more on an economy driven by intangible assets, and the, and the numbers here are that 30 years ago, our economy and, and market value was represented about 15% in intangible assets, you know, in idea, knowledge-based assets, and 85% in physical capital. Today, it's exactly the opposite. It's uh, about 15% in you know, physical capital, like plant and real estate and equipment, 
and uh, 85% in those intangible assets, our know-how, our information flows, our data analysis. If we don't figure out how to capitalize this, then we're never going to we're never going to really get that latent capital and put it to work. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, we use data, right? We use information, but utilizing an asset is a different thing than capitalizing it. To do that, we have to make markets. And that brings me to the, the third number, the number five, because I think there's five things that we've done really well in the United States that have made us the global leader and that are going to be necessary for us to overcome this third trap. So what is it? First of all, we compete. We foster competition. It began with, uh, you know, the founders' emphasis on interstate commerce. Second, we fail. We not only enable and allow failure through our bankruptcy system, but we actually encourage it through intellectual property rights. Um, third, we respect private property rights. That's as fundamental to the American economy as anything I can think of, and I would argue it's been the basis for our success. Fourth, we surround those property rights with the rule of law, and I thought Kim was spot on when she uh, called the attention to that. And fifth, we make markets. We create the, the mechanisms and the infrastructure to move resources to make sure that we don't have our cash sitting under the mattress, but that we're putting it to work. We do it through our financial systems, our credit systems, our markets for equities, for bonds, for commodities. Why haven't we done it for intangible assets? I would argue that the country that overcomes this third trap first, this missing capital trap, is going to rule the economy for the next 100 years. I think it ought to be us. I worry that instead, instead of doubling down on these strengths, we're giving ourselves some self-inflicted wounds. We're helping the world to use antitrust as a weapon against our innovators instead of creating the right model here at home. We're getting so far into the weeds that we're losing sight of what's really at stake for our economy. We're encouraging uh, legislation that limits our ownership of, of intellectual property instead of facilitating it. Again, exactly the wrong move. The Chinese, for all the complaints about the way they treat our intellectual property, they clearly they see there's a competition going on here. They are structuring their market, and we better get there first. So if we can overcome this third trap, keep doing these five things well, those 784 clinical trials will be the floor, and we will be ready for this pandemic. To overcome this pandemic, we'll be ready for the competition from China, and we'll lead into the 21st century. This is the group here that I'm counting on to, to take us there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. And thank you to all of our speakers today. Would you please give a, a round of applause for all of our panelists? Well, today's discussion, I think, goes a long way to advancing this conversation about antitrust and intellectual property and that nexus. So I'm going to share just a, a couple of takeaways from this uh, discussion. Uh, I think first place to start is that inventions spark competition. That should be a takeaway, I do believe. If not the only takeaway, then the fundamental one. In inventions spark competition. How so? Well, in inventors who protect their property rights through IP are able to uh, take that innovation and apply it through entrepreneurship against monopolies, against the big players. But there's a caveat, and the caveat is if they can effectively enforce that. And I think that point has come up uh, quite clearly as well today. But if we let it, invention sparks competition. Another is that uh, takeaway is that uh, inventions, especially in the R&D based companies, uh, 
that are, uh, many of them are adopted into the, the standard of a new technology. And this is vital because this innovation, these innovation advancements lay the foundation. They laid the enabling foundation for others to build on. And that's the point. You've got the, the ones who, who create the standard setting enabling inventions, it gets translated into standardization, which em enables others to build on it. And that, I think, was pointed out by Kim particularly, that that is, uh, is they both have a role. My takeaway is that you can't have the application on top if you don't have the, the foundation underneath. So in priority, it should be, be uh, really uh, viewed as, as essential to, uh, to promote standardization and to give, uh, yes, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, but fair market returns on the, the foundation to the, uh, the standardization uh, related patents and inventions. Another takeaway is that inventors bore the risks. And so those inventor, inventors and innovators deserve the rewards. And I think that the, uh, the joint policy statement that was referenced earlier uh, goes a long way toward establishing that standard essential patents as well as all other patent and IP owners should have access to reasonable royalties and other remedies, uh, injunctive relief, lost profits, ref uh, enhanced damages when there's willful infringement, and so forth. Another takeaway that I would uh, suggest is that uh, innovators who bore those upfront costs and risks may be more likely to face holdout by implementers in many instances than innovators are to be holding up the licensing of their patents. It seems sometimes there are a lot of uh, instances where implementers can get away with refusing to negotiate licensing agreements in good faith. They can turn around and charge innovators with anti-competitive conduct they cry antitrust and seek to turn a Fran commitment into a compulsory licensing clause. There's something wrong with that picture. Another takeaway, antitrust enforcers and lawmakers with a bone to pick with successful innovators don't have crystal balls. They don't know what invention is going to be a commercial success. They don't know which technology will contribute to a standard someday. They don't know which applications will be developed to implement the technology and thereby serve consumer welfare. And the chances, frankly, of commercial success are pretty slim. So making up novel antitrust laws to punish iterative invention or antitrust enforcement imprudently applied against innovators who were engaged in dynamic competition can be highly destructive. And such legislating and regulatory enforcement ultimately, to me, seems to harm consumer welfare. Finally, fostering dynamic competition through antitrust enforcement humility when IP is involved is extremely important. It's important for the respecting of intellectual property rights. It's important for benefiting from all the, ben the potential innovation effects. It's important for America's industrial comp competitiveness. It's important for our national security. And it's important for progress of the useful arts. With that, thank you again for all of you joining us today. And thank you for your contribution as, as good listeners. Uh, we appreciate once more the, the support of our, our sponsors, and we hope to see you at the reception in a little while. Thank you.